So thank you very much, Ben. Uh, as you can see, my thesis is titled Colonialism, Self-Rule, and the Asian Tigers, Tracing the Drivers Behind 50 Years of Economic Success. Now to begin, I want to share with you a little bit about why I chose this topic. And I thought of uh, no better way to do this uh, than to give you a dramatic reading of a song that is very close to my heart. Uh, this is something I grew up uh, singing in school, uh, and it's titled, uh, We Are Singapore. <laughs> so, and it goes like this. There was a time when people said that Singapore wouldn't make it, but we did. There was a time when trouble seemed too much for us to take, but we did. We built a nation strong and free, reaching out together for peace and harmony. Now, you need to imagine that as we sang this song in school, our teachers would flash us pictures of this, Singapore in the 1950s, uh, slum-like, poor, and then they would juxtapose this with pictures of this, Singapore today, uh, modern, clean, efficient, and prosperous. Now, while I uh, you know, recite the lyrics with some jest, uh, there is some reason for such a triumphant uh, narrative. Uh, as you can see here, um, Singapore's growth, uh, represented in blue, has been tremendous over the last 50 years. Uh, green, you see uh, USA GDP per capita, and what has basically happened is that while the US has started off at a much higher level, uh, Singapore's growth has been much faster, uh, leading to a rapid conversions in the last few years. Now, Singapore is not alone in this. Uh, there are a few other nations that have done such rapid growth. You see South Korea and Taiwan in the yellow and gray uh, that also started off with very low levels of income and that have converged with nations of high income status. Now, China, uh, represented in red, that has been celebrated as a very fast-growing economy, uh, is still incredibly poor compared to these other nations. Now, this has led to a lot of governments uh, claiming credit for the rapid economic success uh, seen of late. Um, I mean, after all, if you're a government and you have overseen this growth, why wouldn't you want to celebrate this and say that that is all you're doing and legitimizes rule and helps you stay in power? But I think what's very important to note is that prior to 1950, prior to 1945, uh, Taiwan and South Korea were Japanese colonies. Uh, Singapore as well, prior to 1959, was a British colony. And so my thesis uh, comes in to problematize the, the idea that the ra rapid economic success that we have seen is purely a result of post-colonial rule. And so I ask, could, there, could um, colonial governments that happened prior to 1950 contr have contributed in any way to the economic success we see today? And so this is the research puzzle and my question. The question is, did colonialism contribute in any way to the Asian tiger's long-term economic success? And if it did, what was the extent of the contribution relative to that of post-colonial governments? And my thesis has theoretical significance in two areas. The first is it contributes to uh, scholarship which uh, I find is, is rather restrictive and which falls under the category of what I call the nationali nationalistic perspective. So very much like the song uh, that I recited at the start, uh, there's arguably a dearth of literature willing to recognize that colonialism could have contributed to long-run economic growth and that existing literature currently surrounds a nationalistic angle. And so uh, this literature says that policy choice by post-colonial governments leads to positive impacts on a growth variable, for example, industrialization, and ultimately this leads to high long-term economic growth. My thesis comes into this by saying that perhaps a colonial president and legacy could have contributed to the economic growth. Secondly, my thesis contributes uh, to what I feel is a snapshot view of in, terms of in the existing literature. Uh, so for for scholars who do recognize that colonialism could have impacted growth, they say that capital stock or machinery uh, inherited by a post-colonial government is very important for growth. 
right? So perhaps the Japanese left the Koreans with a lot of heavy machinery. And so this, you know, clearly shows that uh, Korea benefited from colonialism. However, what they don't do is they don't engage in a process trace and whereby they assess what happens to that machinery over time. Uh, and what you find is that there may be large amounts of capital stocks that get destroyed during a civil war, or there may be depreciation and plundering under interim regimes. And this means that uh, there's discontinuity in terms of the legacy of colonialism. And so uh, my, thesis, my thesis aims to uh, plug the gaps in these uh, areas of existing research. Now there's practical significance uh, for my thesis as well. Uh, I argue that it helps policymakers understand whether there are colonial prerequisites for achieving the kind of growth seen in the Asian tigers, and really to understand what exactly can be replicated in the post-colonial era. Now, how do I do this? I use a comparative case study approach of South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. Uh, why did I choose a case study approach? Um, I found that there are very, very few countries in the world that have demonstrated the kind of rapid economic growth seen in the Asian Tigers. Um, you know, I, I was just running some numbers the other day, and, and the, over the last 50 years, there are only six nations in the world that have achieved more than a 5% GDP per capita uh, real growth over 50 years. And so my cases cover half of all of, all of those countries. And what I do is within each country, I process tra trace three growth variables. Uh, and attribute them to either colonial rule or post-colonial rule, or a mix of both. Uh, these three growth variables are strong government bureaucracy, uh, government business relationships, and export-oriented industrialization. Now I'm going to go in a bit more detail about what each of them mean, but before that I want to preface by saying that there's one big assumption in these variables, and that is that the state can drive growth. Now, this is in direct contrast to classical or neoclassical economic theory that argues for private enterprise driving growth. Uh, so that's just one big assumption that I'm putting out there. So uh, this is a bit more about my definitions and my methods of, of assessment uh, for my three growth variables. But last night, as I, was, as I was presenting to a friend, she told me, don't go all jargony. Please explain this to me. And, in, in real life terms that I can imagine. So strong government bureaucracy, imagine this with me, okay? A group of Asian young men, very technocratic, very uh, meritocratically selected, uh, all in a room picking industries for a country to invest in, okay? So, so you know, think of your, 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 your top finance guys uh, picking firms to, to invest in, uh, this is happening at the state level. They're picking industries, not just individual firms to invest in, but entire industries to channel uh, state money into. So here, the state operates a lot like a venture capitalist, but just at a very macro scale. And I argue that this allows for a lot of accelerated macroeconomic growth. Uh, in terms of strong business government relationships, now imagine that same group of, of Asian men going out with private business CEOs. Okay, and going for drinks and karaoke and saying, look, um, you know, we have valued your firm really well. We value your industry really well. Now we want to give you that seed funding. We want to extend preferential credit. We've worked with the state bank, and we're going to extend the subsidies and these credits to you. So strong business government relationships. And thirdly, export-oriented industrialization. Uh, we know industrialization means to, to, uh, to manufacture, to create uh, uh, a lot of goods. Um, now, this it's not just mechanization and, and manufacturing that these countries underwent, but they did so with the aim of export orientation. So this allowed them to reach really wider markets. So again, the state would say to private businesses, look, we're going to give you this special financing, but you have to reach a wider market. You have to go beyond our borders, and that's what we believe is going to drive rapid growth. So. Um, you know, I, I went through many methods of assessments. I just listed the top ones here. Um, but I, I analyzed uh, uh, primary and secondary documents and looked at quantitative and qualitative data. Um, and then finally made my judgment on whether it was colonialism or post-colonialism that led to most of these factors. So 
these are my findings uh, for the first variable of achieving a strong bureaucracy. Now, the graphics I'm going to show you are a little complicated, so I ask that you don't get lost in the text, but instead you follow the colors and you follow my commentary. So, ooh, the colors aren't really coming out. Okay. <laughs> so the first, so colonial rule here, um, it's meant to be in a different color. Okay. So what you see, what you see here is that all of this, the last four boxes belong to self-rule. So in the case of Korea, for achieving a strong bureaucracy, I argue that um, post-colonial uh, institutions are way stronger than what they inherited from colonialism. And so what you see is the, uh, the dominance of post-colonial institutions at the expense of a colonial origin. Okay, so now contrast this with Taiwan, uh, whereby at the time of independence or the time of the return to the KMT, um, colonialism, colonial legacies were allowed to persist and then merged with new innovations from Taiwanese bureaucracy to form a hybrid bureaucracy that demonstrates both colonial as well as post-colonial legacies. So here you're already starting to see some variation between Korea and Taiwan. Korea let nothing continue. Taiwan let a mix, uh, had a mix of colonial as well as post-colonial legacies to form a hybrid bureaucracy. And for Singapore, uh, the case is very much similar to Korea uh, that replaced the existing colonial bureaucracy with post-colonial rule. For strong government business relationships, here you see Korea letting some of the uh, businesses created under colonialism continue. Um, so uh, your big family conglomerates in Korea, uh, some of them emerged under Japanese colonial rule and it was in the, in, in the interest of the state to allow them to continue uh, as well as to, to continue to support new emerging businesses under post-colonial rule, which led to a hybrid of post-colonial and colonial legacies. Uh, for Taiwan and Singapore, uh, they were completely dominated by post-colonial institutions, and so none of the strong business government relationships that you see in those two countries were really a result of colonial legacy. And for export orientation, uh, here we see um, Korea and Taiwan, again, their post-colonial uh, regimes dominating uh, past colonial legacies. And so colonialism really did not contribute to the export orientation or export oriented industrialization that we see uh, in Korea and Taiwan today. Whereas in Singapore, which was really a uh, very outward facing anthropole uh, under the British, um, a lot of that export orientation has carried on into Singapore's uh, industrialization today. And so it's a combination of really both uh, colonial legacy as well as post-colonial rule. So what does this mean uh, for, for developing countries? What are the theoretical as well as the practical implications? Well, the first is that um, there are many pathways to becoming a tiger. Right? What I've shown is that countries have chosen to uh, forget the colonial past, to build off their colonial past. In each of the growth variables, no one country was exactly the same in terms of how it decided to incorporate or reject its colonial history. The second point is that even the final form of what it means to be a tiger has variations. So um, I glossed over this just now, but in terms of business government relationships, Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore all had very strong business government relationships, right? But the uh, form and the configuration of the relationship was very different from country to country. So in Korea, what you saw was a state that really prized and, and treated private indigenous enterprise very well. Uh, in Taiwan, what you see actually is a reliance on state-owned enterprises. So because the private sector was so weak, uh, in Taiwan, there were no Hyundai's or, or, or Samsung's to, to champion, the state had to come in and create their own enterprises. 
And for Singapore, which also lacked a strong domestic business class, uh, Singapore turned to foreign direct investment. So again, Korea ended up with prizing local businesses, Taiwan with prizing state-owned enterprises, and Singapore with prizing foreign, uh, foreign firms. Right? All of them strong business government relationships, but highly different in their configurations. And so even the final form of what it means to be a tiger has variations. And third, uh, post-colonial regimes have agency to break away from previous path dependency. So if the British left you with something that you know, was not favorable for growth, uh, Singapore showed that they were able to disrupt, uh, to move away, to break away from it. Um, if if uh, colonial Japan left Taiwan or Korea with something that was also not preferential, they were also able to break away from it. Uh, and the converse was also true. If colonial Japan left Taiwan or Korea with something that was very beneficial, as was the case of a strong bureaucracy, it's possible, obviously, to botch that up, as Korea did um, under Syngman Rhee. And so uh, post-colonial regimes have tremendous agency to break away uh, and forge their own path. Now, this has uh, practical implications as well. Um, uh, you may be able to tell that, this, that you know, I, I'm bringing a fairly optimistic bent to this, right, by saying that it doesn't matter what your past is, you could, you could build off your past or you could break away completely from it. Um, but I urge some caution in, um, in assuming that then it becomes so easy for us to replicate what was seen with the Asian tigers across uh, other developing nations. Um, I think that uh, it's very important to understand that there are, certain, there are other preconditions that are very necessary for the kind of Asian growth we've seen. For one, uh, Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore were all highly politi politically illiberal. Um, they had strong men rulers uh, for 15, 20 years. Um, and that is, may not be very achievable in a more democratic polity. Um, also, Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore were all either islands or peninsulas, which meant that they had very easy access to international trading routes, and export orientation was certainly much easier. So for a country like Rwanda or Laos, you may see that um, the kind of export orientation is much more difficult to achieve. And so finally, I'm going to end uh, with future research. Uh, what I would like to do in the future would be to trace uh, more variables. Um, yes, I've, I've chosen three growth variables, and I dropped education, healthcare, and macroeconomic stabilization. I did so mainly because um, I thought these were more distant factors, more or more underlying factors. Uh, and macroeconomic stabilization, yes, it's a it's a very close factor to economic growth, but there's a lot of debate about whether it was really relevant uh, in the Asian cases. But I would like to pursue them uh, with future research. Uh, second, I would like to study uh, the interaction uh, between the variables. I've kind of treated each variable in isolation and traced their histories uh, and didn't really allow them to interact with one another throughout my analysis. I think that if I did, I would be able to draw out um, how such interaction created positive externalities. Um, and so, yes, so that's, that's essentially it. I just wanted to say also a big thank you uh, to my primary advisor, Professor Varshney, um, who taught an excellent class uh, in this topic, which really got my interest uh, going. Uh, Professor David Weiss, uh, my second reader, who engaged with me despite uh, being away from Brown, and to Professor Claudia Allett, who really led an excellent uh, seminar for us as well. So thank you very much.